Welcome to another Authors at Google Talk. My name is Katherine Wong, and I'm pleased to introduce Jennifer A. Lee. Um, she wrote the book that you all have right now, <coughs> Fortune Cookie Chronicles. Uh, she, Lee graduated from Harvard College in 1999, um, and then went on to intern for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe, Newsday, and the New York Times, uh, while working on her applied mathematics and economics degree. She then joined the Times in 2001 as a staff writer there. Um, I'm not going to introduce much more about her book because I'm sure she'll speak for herself. So here she is. Thank you. Oh, wow. I am really mic'd up. So my name is Jennifer Lee and I'm obsessed with Chinese food and I um, appreciate the fact you're indulging my obsession. So I'm just going to start. It's, a, it's about a 20 minute presentation and it's actually pretty funny so I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so basically there are more Chinese restaurants in this country than McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Wendy's combined. It's actually the most prolific food on the planet, served on all seven continents, even Antarctica, uh, because Monday night is Chinese food night at McMurdo Station, which is a main scientific station in Antarctica. It's actually even served in space, uh, because NASA serves uh, sweet and sour pork on its shuttle missions. And uh, Chinese restaurants have played a large role in history. The Cuban Missile Crisis was actually resolved in a Chinese restaurant called Yenching Palace, which is uh, in Washington, DC. And um, the house where John Wilkes Booth and others planned the assassination of Abraham Lincoln is actually now a Chinese restaurant called Walk and Roll in Washington, DC. So the Americanness of Chinese restaurants actually really hit me at a point where um, in 2005, with a Powerball drawing, so basically, the way that's, that uh, Powerball works is that they, they assume a certain number of winners based on the number of ticket sales. So they were, they were expecting about three or four second place winners. And instead, they actually got 110, which kind of shocked them. Because they're like, where do these people come from? And uh, they started investigating. Like, well, it's all over the country. So it wasn't just uh, isolated in some sort of weird glitch. And they're like, OK, maybe people put patterns on the grids, because a lot of people do that, and it wasn't that. Uh, they're like, OK, maybe it was Lost, because there is actually an episode of Lost that involves a guy who has a lottery number, which ends up being a very unlucky number, and it wasn't that. So, uh, and then they thought, oh, maybe it was The Young and the Restless, which also had a plot line that involved um, uh, like a, lot of, a Powerball lot, lottery number, and it wasn't that. So as the winners started coming in day by day, um, they asked, well, where did you get your number from? And the first person said, well, I actually got it from a fortune cookie. And the second person said, I got it from a fortune cookie. And the third person said, I got it from a fortune cookie. So they were actually totally befuddled. But basically, all of the winners around the country were, a lot of them had gotten their number from a fortune cookie. So I actually observed this. And I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. Um, and so I went across the country and tried to find all these winners. This is one woman who's in Wyoming. She's actually the founder of the uh, Elvis Presley International Fan Club. That is her at 16, and that is her now. And um, she actually has a lot of handwritten letters from Elvis. She says she was a really, he was a really bad speller. So I actually went and looked at all of these restaurants across the country. Um, these are all places where people got some of their fortune cookies from. And a lot of them were called China Buffet, actually. And they were from places called Powell, Wyoming, Dover, New Hampshire, Manitowoc, uh, Wisconsin, Bernalillo, New Mexico, Wichita, Omaha, Scottsdale, Arizona, Caledonia, Minnesota, population 2,965, which did not stop it from being the wild turkey capital of Minnesota. So when I um, kind of looked at all of these places all across the country, I was like, huh. This is really interesting, because all of them had the same story. And all of them basically involved you know, Chinese food. It could be lunch, it could be dinner, it could be buffet, it could be a sit down. It could be with work, coworkers, it could be with friends. But ultimately, all the stories involved a fortune cookie and involved um, a Chinese, Chinese restaurant. So I was like, huh, well, if our benchmark for Americanness is apple pie, how often do you apple, eat apple pie versus how often do you eat Chinese food? So the thing to remember is that this wasn't actually always the case. When the Chinese first came to America, uh, the, the Americans thought they ate dogs, if not dogs, cats, if not cats, rats. In fact, the New York Times, which is my employer, wrote an article in 1883 that asked, do the Chinese eat rats? <laughs> yeah, and uh, the answer in the end, they decided, was 
there was no evidence of rats or cats to be seen. So it seems kind of unreasonable, but given the imagery at the time, um, not totally out of the question. This is an ad for rat poison called Rough on Rats. And you'll see very subtly under the word clears, it says they must go, which it refers both to the rats and to the Chinaman. Because basically, you have to realize that food was a way that differentiated us versus them. Um, if they ate something different from us, they must be different from us. And so uh, it's really interesting to see this in American history. So for example, there was a court case in the end of the 1800s where a Chinese man was on trial for murder. And the lawyer said to the judge, your honor, what do you expect? They eat rice with sticks. And he was actually the defense lawyer. So he was defending the Chinese man. And another thing, um, this is going to be cut off. There was actually a, um, this is in the Library of Congress. It's called, it's by the Hero of the American Labor Movement and by uh, Samuel Gompers. And it's called Some Reasons for Chinese Exclusion, Meat versus Rice, American Manhood Against Asiatic Coolism, Which Still Survive. And so basically the argument that was being made there was that Chinese, because they ate rice, would pull down the standard of living for American men who ate meat. And the reason why there was sort of the strong anti-Chinese sentiment, in part, is because what the Chinese were like when they first got to America. Um, now, when the, the first generation of Chinese that came, came from an area of China called Toisan, uh, which is about a four-hour bus ride from Hong Kong. And it's so sad, it's not even actually in the Lonely Planet. Um, so when the Chinese first came, they didn't work in restaurants, because the Americans didn't want to eat in Chinese restaurants, since they thought they ate cats or dogs or rats. So they worked in things like mining and railroads, agriculture, and factories, uh, which didn't go over so well with the American man, because basically these people were stealing their jobs. So there was a lot of waves of anti-Chinese violence up and down the West Coast, as far north as Tacoma and as far south as Los Angeles. And meanwhile, they also boycotted um, the employers that actually tried to um, hire the Chinese men. So this actually had a big impact in driving the spread of Chinese restaurants um, two ways. One, it, it forced a lot of the Chinese away from the West Coast into um, the interior and onto the East Coast. And that's when you see a lot of the proliferation of New York, Philadelphia, DC, and Boston Chinatowns. And it also forced Chinese <clears throat> into two self-employed fields, one which was laundries and the second one which is restaurants. And you ask, well, why these two? And uh, the answer is, well, one is cleaning and the other one is cooking, which are both women's work. And that was actually, therefore, safe for the Chinese um, because the, the American men were not threatened by that. So at that time, then, they needed something to do for, uh, to feed Americans, since Americans weren't wanting to eat rats or cats or dogs. So they invented, actually, a dish called chop suey, which is sort of an interesting dish. Uh, it's a mix, basically a vegetable medley mixed with meat. And it became very, very popular. Within 10 years or so, <clears throat> between 1896 and 1904, the dish became a hit. It became a way that you could show you were sophisticated. It was a way that men actually, want, if they wanted to impress their dates, they took them to eat chop suey. And uh, to the point where there were cookbooks. And as this cookbook in 1928 said, the reason you haven't been able to cook chop suey until now is because it is, uh, you haven't had the authentic Chinese recipes. So the funny thing is chop suey is probably the biggest culinary joke that one culture has played on another, because chop suey in Chinese translates to zasui, which translates to basically odds and ends. And so most rumors of chop suey actually involve this guy, um, Li Hongzhang, that either he started it or someone else started it. And because they didn't like what was being served. And so the chef made up some dish and then served it. But if you go back into history and you look at <clears throat> his visit to America, there's actually no mention of chop suey to be found in the New York Times, which had obsessively covered his, his, um, his visit. And in, instead, actually, what I found is um, in 1904, there was an article um, called where, where this guy actually comes in from San Francisco, and he says that he was actually the original inventor and sole proprietor of chop suey. Unfortunately, it's cut off here. But he, said, he basically claims that, um, oops, let's go back here. Uh, 
he was the guy who, he, and he, he basically came to New York and he's like, you know what, I, I, I'm going to exercise my intellectual property rights. I want all of you guys who are making chop suey to stop because I actually have the right to the recipe. And he says that he was in San Francisco when he was told by a restaurant owner to create a dish that would pass as Chinese and gratify the, the public craze at the time. And um, then he then, we would never quote anyone like this in the New York Times, but basically what he's saying there is that the American man stole his recipe. This guy spent all this time kind of looking for him. And now that he's found him, he wants either a recipe back or he wants other people who are making chop suey to pay him for the right for it. So what's interesting about chop suey is it's actually a mix between the exotic and the familiar, right? It's vegetables which are kind of familiar and just a little bit exotic, but also the meats are very familiar. It's always pork or chicken or um, beef. And the interesting thing about chop suey is that it's sort of the, the first genesis of, a, of the recipe that Chinese restaurant owners have used forever, which is basically taking something which is familiar and something exotic and then sort of combining them into one. So you see this actually today with another dish, uh, General's House Chicken, which I'm absolutely obsessed with. And I actually spent um, a lot of time traveling the country eating this dish. It is, it is sort of the ultimate Chinese American dish because it is uh, chicken, it is fried, and it's sweet, all things that Americans love. And all around the country you see it called things like um, what do you say? You see it called General Gao, General So, General Tao, General um, To. And except for one place, which I think is really funny, which is at the US Naval Academy, it's called Admiral Tao's Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, why are we, uh, who is General Tao and why are we eating his chicken? So I actually went to China, I think. Did I go to China? Why am I not going to China? OK. Uh, I went to China and um, kind of went looking for General Tao. So, uh, I went to find General Tao's family, actually, in China. And it's funny, he's actually a fame, his real name in Chinese is Zhuo Zhongkang. He's a famous Qing Dynasty military hero. And he actually played an important role in, um, in terms of the um, Taiping Rebellion, where 20 million people died because it was a war that was started by a guy who thought he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ and also the son of God. And uh, this guy actually finally gave us a ride, or he gave us, he hitched a ride, and he said, go drive to the end of the road and then turn right. And so someone else actually gave us a map of, of where General Tao's family lived. So this is actually the billboard where General Tao is from. Uh, it says, welcome to the hometown of General Tao. This is General Tao himself. And so I actually went looking for chicken and uh, found a cow. I actually did find some chicken in the end, and uh, they were actually crossing a road. And these were General Tao's relatives who had never, ever seen or heard of this dish before in their life. Uh, but they were not surprised that I was visiting because he was, after all, a famous general. And they did offer me dog, because they actually do eat dog meat in that part of the country. And they uh, basically, I was thinking, oh my god, General Tao's puppy is just not a dish that's going to go over <laughs> well in America. So it struck me that actually, you know, General Tao in America is like Colonel Sanders. He's known for chicken and not war. But in China, he's actually known for war and not chicken. So the, the question is, well, where does General Tao's chicken actually come from? And it was actually introduced in New York City in the 1970s, early 1970s, a recipe, which is uh, sort of the same time as this logo and also me. So we're all around the same age. And it turns out that the chef who made it is actually alive still in Taiwan. Uh, specifically Taipei, and so I actually went and found him. He's retired. He plays a lot of mahjong, actually. His son runs the um, restaurant, and there was General's House Chicken on his on the menu, and that that's the original version of General's House Chicken, which is actually not. Um, a lot of people don't really like it. Uh, oh, sorry, a lot of people here when in America wouldn't like it because it it's not sweet and it's not fried. It involves a lot of skin and chicken and sort of a soy saucy flavor. So it's really interesting to see how General's House Chicken has evolved over time. And so I actually showed him all the pictures where, um, of the General's House Chicken that I had brought across the country. And he was like, no, no, no. He, he was very upset, actually. He was like, no, no, no. And I have some video. It's very funny. And at the end, he was, he was pointing at the broccoli. He's like, what's that? And I was like, it's broccoli. He's like, what is broccoli? Because it's not a very commonly used vegetable in Chinese cooking. And at the end, he just got up and he was like, mo ming qi miao, which means like nonsense. And he sort of walked off. Um, so it's interesting, because um, one of the things about General Tao's chicken is that it's served by a bunch of people in China. Um, so I'm going to 
actually get to that part. So there, a lot of them are actually from Fuzhou, which is a which is a city in the northern Fujian province. And Fuzhou traditionally is a very very poor um, area. But right now, about three hundred thousand people are missing. Uh, many of them are here in America, sort of serving. General's House Chicken, because it's the single largest area for the exporting of Chinese restaurant workers in the world. I actually have a question. Is there audio? Can I plug an audio on this? Sorry, I forgot. So uh, what's, what's interesting is um, traditionally it's sort of a swampland. But with all the people who have gone to work in Chinese restaurants, they've sent all their money back to China to build these homes. Which are these are all single-family homes or mansions, about four or five stories high, and um, it's they're not apartment buildings. But what's really interesting about them is because they love um, tile. Everything sort of has the inside, kind of the look of sort of an inside-out bathroom. Oops, sorry. Um, and this is sort of their construction. Um, each one of these houses costs two hundred and fifty thousand dollars about to build. And they did have chicken actually in this town, but what they did not have actually was people, because most of these towns are empty, or many of these towns are empty because all the people have left. There, in this town, for example, there are no men of working age. It is a town of naturally about five thousand, four thousand of them are gone. There are uh, old men, women and children, but no men of working age. So it's almost like a nation at war, except that there is actually no war. But what they also do have here is um, English language schools that teach restaurant English to teenagers who are preparing to legally and illegally immigrate. So bamboo shoots, sesame, curd. And then, so they write on the board, and one of the things that the guy was very, very emphatic in teaching his students is you want to say fried rice. You do not want to say fried rice, and you do not want to say French fries. And um, this guy here was actually not paying attention very much, and I think he's going to end up being a delivery man, actually, which is true, because a lot of the, the women actually turn, turn out to be the ones that answer the phones and take the orders. The other thing that they have is there are a lot of um, kids who are born in America and actually sent back to because their parents don't have time to raise them. Mm -hmm. oh, is this going to be cut off? Where are you born? It's America. Mama, Papa, where are you? Where are your parents? They're in America. What are they doing? Working. And I ask, where is America? <laughs> it's really sad. And um, so on that happy note, uh, we'll go to fortune cookies, which Americans love. There are chocolate fortune cookies, orange fortune cookies, uh, raspberry fortune cookies, mint fortune cookies, wedding fortune cookies, Christmas fortune cookies, um, Valentine's Day, and Hanukkah fortune cookies, fortune cookie jewelry, USB fortune cookies, even fortune cookies for dogs, which I thought was funny. But uh, where are there not fortune cookies, actually? I think China. So I brought a whole bunch of fortune cookies to China to sort of tape the Chinese people's reactions to them. What is this? So I actually went kind of hunting. Well, they're not from China. Where are they from? So I went to some of the biggest and oldest fortune cookie factories in the country. I found an old, you know, men who actually made their business just making the fortunes, not women who actually folded the fortune cookies themselves by hand. An old Japanese woman, an old uh, Chinese man, even a man that sort of looked like Confucius, so you can't see him here. Um, then what was interesting is this thing, which is Hong Kong tea cakes. <clears throat> this is probably the oldest existing um, fortune cookie in the world, because it's an unopened can from about the 1950s. They, for whatever reason, they hadn't even opened them. And I actually knocked them over. And I heard them like disintegrating as they hit the floor. And I felt really bad. But, but he was like, don't worry, I wasn't going to open them anyway. Um, but what's interesting is it, it, they're called Hong Kong tea cakes. But you know, who doesn't eat cakes with their tea? That's the Chinese. But who does? The Japanese. It actually took me to 
a bunch of uh, Japanese bakeries, including this one in LA and this one in San Francisco, called Ben Kyoto, which is on the corner of Sutter and Buchanan. Buchanan. And they make fortune, uh, they make sort of des Japanese desserts here, but it also doubles as a diner, very oddly, and the kinds of things that they serve in cotton blue, like Polish sausage. So Ricky led me to his cousin, Teresa, who led me to a guy named Gary, who is the only person in the world as obsessed with fortune cookies as I am. Um, so Gary actually really interestingly has um, these irons that he said were the original ones that were used to make fortune cookies when they first came to America. These were the these were the irons that were used to make fortune cookies in the San Francisco Golden Gate Park in the Japanese Tea Garden. So the, the other thing that he had, which was really interesting, was um, this drawing of a man in Japan making fortune cookies in the early 19, early sorry, the late 1800s. And I was like, wow, I'm going to Japan. So I went to Japan, where they actually are still family-run bakeries, where they're making fortune cookies. They're a little bit different. They're browner um, and not as sweet. They're flavored with miso and sesame. And this guy actually showed me his irons, which I think actually looks a lot like Gary's. And, um, and they were the, and very similar to the ones that were used by the guy in the, the drawing. So if you put them side by side, you can definitely see the fam sort of the family resemblance. And so I was wondering, well, if fortune cookies are Chinese now, and they started out being Japanese, like when did that switch happen? And as I talked to all of the bakeries, I was like, oh, you know, you've been open for 100 years. Wow, that's really amazing. They're like, yeah, it's been like three generations, and we were here, except for that time when we were all locked up um, during World War II. So basically, as I can see it, as I did my research, we locked up all the Japanese during World War II, two-thirds of which were citizens, and many of which um, worked, you know, had family-owned businesses. So the, the fortune cookie factories that the Japanese owned all closed down. And at the same time, there was a sharp rise in interest in Chinese food around the country. Because one, during the war, Chinese food makes a little bit of meat go a long way in terms of wartime rationing. And two, um, the Chinese were suddenly our allies during the war. So they were not the people that were, you know, taking away the jobs, we were on the same side. So because there was a sharp rise in interest in, in Chinese food, there was also a sharp demand in terms of fortune cookies. And remember, a lot of the, the, the Chinese actually came from the same neighborhoods and the same uh, communities way, way back when in Toy San. So in terms of the word of mouth, they were able to, to separate it out. So the other thing that I wanted to figure out was, well, where do fortune cookies come from? Um, sorry, where the fortunes come from? Someone actually. Uh, loves the fortune so much that he had invented a fortune album, fortunealbum.com. It's like a photo album, except that instead of photos, you can, sit, you can preserve those little slips of paper. So fortune cookies are not made in China, but actually the fortune albums themselves were. Alibaba.com is where he found them. So I went and found um, the Analects of Confucius. And I was like, well, what did Confucius really, really say? And it turns out he said a lot, very little which for fits on a fortune cookie, partially because the Chinese sensibility is different from American sensibility of looking at the world. So the kinds of things that Chinese sages said back then are not necessarily the ones that they Amer make sense to Americans now. So a good example is in, in English, we have a saying that's the squeaky wheel gets to Greece. In Chinese, have an alternative interpretation of the situation, which is chang da chu tou niao, which means the bird whose head sticks out gets shot. <laughs> or there's another saying, um, China's very rural, so they have a lot of rural kind of folkisms that aren't necessarily ones that make sense to you know, an American society, which is like maybe at best 2% rural. For example, when in a melon patch, do not bend down and tie your shoes, which makes no sense to me at all. And I was like, when my mom said it to me, I was like, is this about prison? I don't know. Um, and in the end, it basically means uh, don't, don't do anything that looks suspicious, even when it's not. So the thing to remember is that a lot of sort of folk wisdoms or common snappy pithy maxims are specific to a culture. Because like my mom has always been really confused because she's like, wait, don't you need your cake in order to eat it? And it's, that's a saying that I don't, still don't completely understand myself. So I actually found this guy who is a um, fortune cookie writer. And I found a whole bunch of other ones. And I asked him, so where do you guys get your inspiration from? So one, he was like, oh, Bartlett's quotations. Another person was like, the Bible. Horoscopes, that's where you get the you have a kind and generous nature thing from. Um, you also have Hallmark. One girl was like, oh, Hallmark has really nice things. Email forwards, has, uh, television. She was like, oh, the OC has like some really like deep lines. Oops, sorry about that. And um, movies. And the movie thing kind of really hit me one day when I was actually in New Mexico and went to one of those fortune cookie restaurants. 
and I got this fortune, which is do or do not. <laughs> there is no try. Yeah? <laughs> you guys recognize it? Yeah? Um, and I was like, oh my god, that's from The Empire Strikes Back. And I was like, Yoda is our new Confucius, right? And this was just all, all of this was just um, Western wisdom recycled for a Western audience, and Chinese are just a middleman. So one of the points I want to make, actually, is that we're really impressed with McDonald's because it basically um, standardized all of the you know, dining and decor and menus across an entire system. But they did it through a, uh, centralized headquarters in Illinois. Chinese restaurants have actually largely done the same thing, but without a centralized headquarters, which was really interesting, right? That you can go into a Chinese restaurant and kind of know that you can order beef with broccoli, wonton soup, and egg, you know, and an egg roll. All of all of things which exist only in different forms in China, if they exist at all. So I kind of think of it as a um, it's interesting how these decisions get made, because it's sort of like a self-organizing spontaneously self-organizing system where like, everyone makes these kinds of little decisions, but then it spreads across the entire system. So for example, um, fortune cookies started in San Francisco but spread across the country. General's House Chicken started in LA, spread across the country. Chop suey, invented maybe by Lemsen, maybe not, but ultimately because it appealed to Americans, it spread across the country. So it's interesting because you know when McDonald's introduces something, like chicken and nuggets, took them 10 years to come up with, like, we need to do a chicken thing. And they experimented with fried chicken, chicken pot pie, before coming up with chicken McNuggets. And then they sort of instituted it everywhere. Chick uh, General's House Chicken introduced one restaurant in New York City in the early 1970s, and within 10 years also became really, really popular. And so the way I like to sort of analogize this is, well, if you think of like McDonald's as Microsoft, like maybe Chinese restaurants are sort of like Linux in terms of that it's open source and that any, anyone can sort of add innovation. And an innovation that's really good can spread across the country. And at the same time, it can be localized for all the, for all the local taste. So that is my, this, the last couple of slides are actually just ones that I added for the people here at Google. <laughs> so that's it. So that's it. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them and um, talk. I can talk all day about Chinese food. I've been obsessing about it for three years. Yes? So, Is it safe to say that we wouldn't recognize the Chinese food in China from what we're used to eating here? Yeah. So there's a whole section in my book of sort of what's the difference between Chinese food in China versus Chinese food here. My, my classmates, which come from China, uh, when I was at Beijing University, when they come here for grad school, they're often warned, like, the Chinese food in Chinese American restaurants is not the kind of food that you would recognize at home. So one of the, the, the main differences is Americans don't like to be reminded that their food ever walked or swam or breathed or flew. So nothing on your plate in an American Chinese restaurant will, will remind you that it was once an animal. So no eyeballs, no claws, no feet, no lungs. But in Chinese food, you know, they're like, bring it on. They really like the entire animal. And I think part of that is a function of shortage. So Chinese food was developed largely during a time when the country was poor, still poor. So they used the entirety of the animal. And the other place where you see this is actually in wok cooking. Wok cooking, incredibly, incredibly energy efficient. Baking, not so energy efficient at all. Right? And, and, there's, and Chinese people historically do not bake. There are not ovens in like, even the fancy like, condo apartments in, in Shanghai. And it's funny, because my friends who are expats are like, oh, we're all sophisticated. Like, we're going to Shanghai you know, you know, work to work for McKinsey or whatever. And they show up, and there are no ovens. And they're like, oh my god, what are we going to do for Thanksgiving? Because they have no idea how to cook a, you know, turkey without an oven. And I'm like, oh, just eat Peking duck. This is what we all eat. But, um, but it is safe to say that most the Chinese food in America is recognizably different uh, from Chinese food in China. And all different countries have different their own versions. So you have Peruvian Chinese food. You have Indian Chinese food. You have Korean Chinese food, you have Jamaican Chinese food. So what's interesting about the standards is that it's, it's something that not just happened in America, but everywhere the Chinese have kind of open restaurants en masse. They've standardized around a set of expectations. Like in France, for example, they have salt and pepper frog legs because, you know, that's what they eat in France. Mm -hmm. Hi, I was wondering if you had made a study of the Chinese versus English names of these various places because I know enough characters to know that sometimes it's the same and sometimes it's not. Yeah, I would say that actually in, in terms of really like true Chinese 
dishes. A lot of them have really elegant sort of creative na names that might not go over so well in an American audience. So for example, there is a, um, a famous Chinese dish called mai shang shu, which basically means ants climb up a tree, which doesn't sound so, so appealing, but basically sort of you know, shredded, shredded meat on crispy noodles. Um, also dishes like you know, lion's head, which it's not really lion's head, they're actually meatballs. Um, I think part of it, what's really nice, so this is, this is one, one thought that I'll have for you. Uh, Korean food, for example, hasn't really taken off the same way that, that, that Chinese food has in America. And we can debate all kinds, you know, is it the spicy, is it the kimchi, whatever. But I think one of the reasons is their names are not standardized in terms of like you, bulgogi, what does that mean to you, right? And it's sort of, wrote, you know, it's like barbecue beef, but the names are not standardized. Whereas in, what's one of the lovely things about Chinese cooking is that the dishes are very descriptive, like beef with broccoli, chicken, cashew nuts, right? So, so sort of the ambiguity and mystery of Chinese food is sort of like dissipated because like, you know, almost looking at the, the description of the dish, what you're going to get. I was actually thinking of the restaurants themselves. So, you know, if you see a restaurant that says Lotus Garden, maybe it does say Lotus Garden. You mean in the, oh, oh, you mean or the name. Like, for example, the Mayflower restaurant. Okay, I see what you're saying. The yes. five month restaurant. Yes, which actually yes, is a which direct, I actually have been to. That my friend got married there, actually. Yes, okay, so you're saying what, so this is the other interesting thing about um, Chinese restaurants in America. They're named kind of in a very standardized, predictable way, right? So there's like often the word panda, often the word dragon, often the word Beijing, Hunan, Sichuan, to the, to the point where you can like drive, this is, this is really interesting because I was doing my old, my old research. Um, I can look at a list of restaurants from the 1950s and tell which restaurants had, were Chinese just by their names. And that's kind of, it's very, very funny because um, there was actually a German restaurant called Lu Chow's L-U-C-H-O-W-S, in German, in New York City, that um, they, they had dropped the umlaut from their name during World War I because of the anti-German sentiment. But by the end, by World War II, they were so tired of people coming in and ordering egg rolls that they put the umlaut back. So the, in terms of the, <laughs> so, so the point there is that, yeah, Chinese restaurants themselves um, are often have very, very different names, partially because what the Chinese want from a name is very different from what Americans want from a name. And not just in restaurants, like in hotels. Like in, in America, we name things after people all the time, like Hyatt, Hilton, um, Marriott, all named after dead white men, right? But um, in China, if you go to the hotels there, they have names like transportation hotel or like communication hotel because that, those are the kinds of names that they want associated with it. So it's, it's, it's a larger split, not just in terms of restaurants, but just in terms of the kinds of things that you name, how Americans tend to name things versus how Chinese people tend to name things as well. This is good. So there have, there have been a few times when I was in Italy and I went to a Chinese restaurant mm -hmm. and then the waitress, after she discovered that I spoke Chinese, would apologize and say, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't really serve Chinese food yeah. here. What do we serve is, you know, Italian food, but <laughs> yeah. uh, does that happen to you a lot? Um, yes. I mean, I've been basically, I think most Chinese people who work in restaurants around the world know that they're all in on some big inside joke that's um, being played on sort of the locals. Um, and it's interesting because in Italy, one of the funny things is, um, one, we serve fortune cookies because that's, you know, Americans expected desserts. But in what do other countries around the world actually serve for dessert because they don't serve fortune cookies? Since like, you know, 99.999% of the fortune cookies in the world are all consumed in the United States. We think they're Chinese or Asian or whatever, but it's really something that's American to the point where it's introduced by the Japanese, it's popularized by the Chinese, and it's consumed by Americans. And in Italy, what they'd serve is actually fried gelato. Yeah, so they take ice cream and they fry it. And my downstairs neighbor is actually Italian, and she was really shocked when I explained to her. I'm like, no, Chinese people don't eat fried gelato. Like, it's not a Chinese dish. But in her mind, it was, it was Chinese because it had been served in every single Chinese restaurant she'd ever been to since she was a child. So, so that's, sort of, that's sort of my, my understanding about Italy. I, I have all, they're all, they're kind of weird things happening in Italy um, in terms of Chinese food. But any other questions? Yeah, more? The worst version, okay, so she asked me, what's the worst version of Chinese food? Um, well, I mean, here's the thing. It's all, uh, I'm kind of like a moral relativist when it comes to food, because the thing is, to them, it's what they're familiar with. It's home. It's something that they enjoy. And so it's the same way that, you know, do I like Chinese food in American Chinese restaurants? 
you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for them. But you know who really loves them? People, for example, that went to Iraq. And when the US invaded Iraq in 2003, now five years, within a couple months, two Chinese restaurants sprung up in the green zone. And I was like, and they were always packed, always packed. And I asked my friends who were there, because they, they either worked as journalists or they worked as um, for the State Department. I'm like, why are you guys eating Chinese food? You should be eating like hummus and like kebab, like, you know, living it up like a Middle Easterner. And what he said to me was, because it's a taste of home. What could be more American than a beer and takeout Chinese? So, right? And so in his mind, it's comfort food because it's what they grew up with. And so bad is all, you know, is, is kind of bad. But I mean, if you, in terms of like what's really, what has horrified me. Um, so in southeastern New, New England, there's a dish called a chow mein sandwich. So you know those like crispy, those crispy fried noodles that you sometimes dip in the, in the, or in the duck sauce? So they take these noodles and then they put gravy, which has celery, like sort of vague chow mein-ish, brownish sauce, and then they put it on a hamburger bun. And they, they sell, it's really popular there. It's actually a local specialty. They, they actually serve it in the school cafeterias. But um, it's sort of vaguely horrifying, but it's actually not that bad. Like if you can get over the idea this is a starch on starch sandwich, it actually tastes pretty good. <laughs> so I think that's something that, that was really strange. And then the other thing is the Northern Europeans and the Irish, I, I think, do some very sad things to Chinese food. But that's OK. It's OK. It's what they want. Anyway, if there are any more questions, that's fine or I can sign books or whatever it is. So I hope you guys know a little bit more about Chinese food. You can obsess about it. We lo I love the Bay Area because they, uh, they like to read and they love Chinese food <laughs> as well. Not as much as the Jews, though, because they love to read, they love Chinese food, and they gather regularly in synagogues and JCCs. So, <laughs> so I really like, um, so I, I, yes. So San Francisco is one of our sort of most exciting places for it. Oh, you have another question. What's your favorite Bay Area? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so last night we actually had an event at a restaurant called Jia Yun. Have you guys ever heard of it? OK. So um, Jia Yun is really interesting. It's like hole in the wall, but not hole in the wall prices. It's like one of those places where you just go in and you tell the chef, like, I'm going to spend 45, 65, 85, and he just cooks whatever. It's in Chinatown. And it's really interesting because um, I actually, part of my journey in the book is trying to find the greatest Chinese restaurant in the world. So I went to places like Mauritius and France and whatever, and trying to understand, well, what do Chinese people, what do people like in the terms of a Chinese restaurant? And when I partially discovered, this is interesting, when um, you know, I would tell people, I'm like, oh my god, I'm trying to find the greatest Chinese restaurant in the world. They're like, well, what if it's like a hole in the wall in like Kenya? And I'm like, it's not going to be a hole in the wall in Kenya. And they're like, how do you know? I'm just like, it's just not. And what was, or they'll go, or they would say, have this reaction, like, oh my god, I just went to the most incredible Chinese restaurant. I have no idea what the name is, but it was in Montreal. It was down this alleyway, and you had to go down the steps, and it was all fluorescent lights. And you know, they gave us toilet paper for tissues, but the food was incredible. And it was, I will try to find a name out for you, for my friend. And what I kind of discovered is that part of the ethos of a Chinese restaurant is that it has to be a little bit hidden and a little bit not known, right? Like if I told you. I'm trying to find the greatest French restaurant in the world. They wouldn't be like, well, what if it's a hole in the wall in Tahiti, right? Because it's not the way that we think of French restaurants. But the thing about Chinese restaurants that we like to think about is this idea that, in a way, it's a hidden gem. It's not obvious. It's not something that you know everyone goes to. That, in a way, it's something that is word of mouth. And so, what's interesting about Jia Yun as a restaurant is it has it really does have incredible food, but you kind of only have to know, like you you you. It's not this, the kind of place that necessarily got like a big write-up, a four-star write-up in the Chronicle or any of the other papers. So that is, that's, that's where if I, I try to recommend to people. I want to you know, go someplace. Sometimes I go there. But it's like a hole in the wall. It's cash only. So it's like you know, $85, but cash only. Mm -hmm. um, but also places I like. Zen, is there a place? There's a, a dim sum place in Millbrae, Zen something? Zen Peninsula, yeah, I think that's really good. Uh, I also, I what I also like in the in the in the Bay Area that you guys that we don't get in the East as much is Muslim Chinese food. Have you guys had Muslim Chinese food? Yeah, that's actually one of the the, the ways that you can tell like a real Chinese restaurant from um, a restaurant for Americans is that if they have lamb on the menu because lamb is actually a big meat in Chinese cooking because of all the Muslims from the West, but not very not a very big meat in America and therefore not a very big meat in American Chinese restaurants. Um, and what else do I like? Um, so I, well, I go to I go to. Is there a place called um, Fatima, which I thought was pretty good. 
and a place called um, Darden, I think. It's, it's, it's one of those restaurants where the Chinese name and the English name completely do not match up at all. And, it, and, um, and it's, I don't know, it's in, in San Jose. I, my friends drive me there. It's in the same, actually, strip mall as the Mayflower, actually, yeah. But um, what else is there? I also went to Sh Shanghai 1930. Have you guys ever been there? It's actually pretty, OK, this is, I have a funny story with that. So I go, I go to Shanghai 1930. It's in a financial district. It's kind of expensive. It's a jazz club. It's, and it's not full, I mean, it's not my parents going there, if that makes sense. So I go downstairs, and the woman, there's a woman there, heavy set from the Midwest. Uh, and the hostess asks her, good evening, madam. How are you today? And she goes, I'm terrible. And we're like, oh. You know, maybe they lost her luggage or something. She goes, I asked my Chinese, no, sorry. I asked my hotel to recommend me a Chinese restaurant where Chinese people eat. And so she points out, actually, at uh, the, the sort of dining room, which is full of yuppies, basically. And she goes, where are the Chinese people? And so in her mind, it could not be like a good Chinese restaurant unless there were Chinese people eating there, which I thought was really interesting. Because in fact, Shanghai 1930 has legitimately good food, and the, the chef is sort of a Malaysian um, Chinese chef. but. It's not authentic unless it's sort of you're surrounded by Chinese people, and that's what's interesting about um, Jai Yuan and some of the other restaurants. That part of the the experience of finding a great Chinese restaurant is a restaurant that's known by Chinese, right? Because you see all the Chinese people, but aren't not is not necessarily known by like the Americans. Which is good. All good. Thank you. I appreciate it.